Why do we love Yoda and recoil at the sight of aliens xenomorph? It's not just that one's a force for good while the other is a vicious predator. There's actually something of a science to making creatures that audiences respond to in meaningful ways. Jim Davies has made a study of that. He is a professor in the Institute of Cognitive Science at Carleton University and director of its Science of Imagination Laboratory. Jim Davies joins us now to explain. This is fantastic. Somebody who actually does this for a living. Isn't it great you that know, there's science about alien design? You've got a great job, man. I do. <laughs> Tell me this. When, when, <clears throat> when the people who are in these fields want to create a compelling alien or monster or whatever, there's a creative sweet spot that you got to hit. That's right. What is the, what's in that sweet spot? So with not just aliens, but with everything, there's a real sweet spot between uh, familiarity and what we're not used to. So there's got to be something new, but it's got to be um, recognizable too. So if it gets too weird, we don't like it. And if it gets too complex and uh, not understandable, we don't like it either. So when people design a, an alien, it's got to have recognizable things that we know from earth animals and human beings, uh, you know, often with a couple of tweaks to it. So it can be too, too creative in that respect then is not good. Right. You don't want to overdo it. If you want to call that create, I mean, yes. Yeah, so if you add too many original features, hmm. it can detract from people's ability to relate to uh, that alien. Gotcha. A couple of terms here I want you to help us understand. The difference between the facilitation effect and the habituation effect. Yeah. What is that? Facilitation is this idea that um, when you understand something, it's easier to process. So people, in general, like what they recognize. You know, So you hear a song you know, uh, your brain responds with, uh, the opioid system, which is pleasure. So you get this like little burst of pleasure when you see a pattern that you recognize. Uh, and that is the facilitation effect. So people, um, if you expose them to uh, pictures a lot, they will like those pictures better. As everyone knows, you he can hear a song a million times and you'll start to like it in spite of yourself. That's facilitation. Habituation is when you, um, you see something so many times that you stop paying attention to it. Huh. Right. And how is that difference uh, relevant for the discussion we're having here in terms well, of you your can love get, for Well, you can get word. tired of things, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, we, you know, there is a point where people, if they see what they perceive to be the same thing over and over again, the same plot structure uh, over and over, they, they might get bored of it because your mind is really good at detecting new things. And it's very good at categorizing and ignoring the stuff it, it knows already. So uh, at some point, the habituation effect can... Uh, take over and override the facilitation. Well, apparently we can't get enough of Star Wars because there's a new movie every year. And uh, thank goodness. I, I well remember, thank goodness he said, <laughs> I well remember as a teenager seeing the first one when it came out in the late 70s. Let's bring this picture up. This is one of the most uh, adorable aliens in motion picture history. That's Yoda. What do you think makes him so compelling to human audiences? Now, Yoda is a very interesting example. Um, he's got what we... Uh, what we consider to be aspects of intelligence in a human being. What I mean by that is when we look at somebody, we make a very quick judgment about how smart they are. And um, <clears throat> having very little hair, being tall, um, uh, having big eyes, uh, these are some of the things that people look for in human beings. And I did a study in my uh, laboratory with a student, Megan McManus, and we actually tested to see if this was the same for aliens, and we found that it was so. So Yoda has some of those things and not others. What's interesting is that if you remember, Yoda is introduced as not being Yoda. Yoda is introduced as being a, a cranky little... He's a kooky little... Yeah, and he's, and he's, thing, and, he's yeah. and he's acting like he doesn't know who Yoda is. Right. So I feel like his whole... I mean, he's, he's taken on life of his own in the Star Wars world. But remember that when he first appeared, he had to look plausibly like a sort of a bumbling, bumbling kind of creature, right? right? <clears throat> if you compare him to... Uh, the Kaminoans, for example, uh, I think we have a picture of them too. You know, they're they're we much do. more classic. Sheldon, you want to bring that up now? The Kaminoans ha are relatively hairless, have decently big eyes, they look recognizably human, right? If you compare either of these, I don't want to have a you know, it's going to be a big slideshow here. But if you compare it to the Gamorreans, for example, Oops. they both look much more intelligent. Okay, than the hang Gamorreans. on. Now that's a Gamorrean. Now clearly, that is not a lovable okay. alien. So no one's going to look at the Gamorrean and th and think that that is plausibly an alien that has created a space-faring. Uh, you know, that they've created uh, like faster than light spaceships and everything else. It looks, it looks stupid. It doesn't look intellectual. Now think about this with like, you know, the alien abduction stories, people who think that they've been sure. abducted by, okay, the Kaminoans look a lot like the gray aliens that people think they're being abducted by. Right. So do the ones from uh, Close Encounters. Yes. But they look plausibly intelligent. Can you imagine if someone said, I got abducted by aliens 
And you say, what do they look like? And they, and they basically describe a Gamorrean. Like, well, they had giant teeth sticking out and little beady eyes, and, and they were fat and, and green. Pig nose. Like, people and, would, yeah, pig yeah. nose. People would be like, that doesn't sound intelligent. Now, that's absurd, <laughs> right? Because why would, you know, who are we to judge like, what an alien is supposed to look like? Now, but we're, we judge them on intelligence. We're having fun with this, but the reality is you've actually done the lab work, which suggests that these different characters <clears throat> fall into different patterns that if, you know, upon which there is a scientific basis for either liking them or not liking them. Is that right? Yeah, that, yeah that's right. And w why is this a line of work you wanted to get into in the first place? Well, I, 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 wrote, I was working on a book uh, about why we find things interesting. And I published that. It's called Riveted. And, you know, um, and I'm also a science fiction uh, writer myself. So I'm, I'm just interested in what works. You know, why does it, what works and why does it work? And I wanted to address the science of that kind of thing. Do you suspect that George Lucas, when he was doing Star Wars or the, all the folks behind Star Trek, knew this, either intuitively or actually through studies? I think they know it intuitively. So when you're designing an alien or anything, uh, designing a, a plot or, you know, what you can do is you can, you can make a draft and you can look at it and you can decide whether it moves you. And if you're good and you have good taste, you're able to do that for the, the audience, right? So I think that when, you know, um, uh, I, I read in, in one of the, the making of Star Wars Episode One. I think they, you know, somebody said they were going to try to create the Darth Maul character, who's got the horns and the tattoos. Yes. They said uh, they told the designers, "Make your worst nightmare." And <laughs> the first draft, they're like, "Okay, make your second worst nightmare," because it was too much for the Star first Wars. One was too right? much. Like Star Wars is not a, uh, a, a truly horrific world. It's not like you get tortures and serial killers. No, it's, kids are going to go to these movies. Yeah, and it's a, so you get you know so uh, they have this intuitive sense of where it's supposed to be. Now, some of them are very explicit about it. So there's a quote by uh, James Cameron, who designed the, the Navi for uh, Avatar. Mm -hmm. And he said, there, and he just said in an interview, there's no reason that they need to look this human. There's no scientific basis. But this is made for, this is a movie for humans, not for a galactic audience. Yes. And we need to be able to recognize their facial expressions. And so some of them are explicit about it, whether or not they know the science. Uh, <clears throat> what do, uh, you know, I'm really trying to understand this process more, where the creators actually sit down and have a checklist and they, they need to check the boxes for the qualities that they think will make a character more either sympathetic or more fearful to a human audience. I don't, I, I don't know. I don't, we don't have access to the inner workings of, of these creature designers. But so you do have I, a checklist, though. I do. Yeah. I don't know if they do. What's on your checklist? Uh, well, if you, want, if, you want, um, if you want someone to empathize and care about a creature, then you need to... Um, you need to make it recognizable. You need to be able to recognize its emotions. Okay, so and a face is really important for that. Okay, so you notice that all the stormtroopers, they basically don't have faces. Can't they all, they faces. never take off their their masks. And I even thought they were droids when I saw Star Wars and when I was five years old. You know? But there are humanoids underneath those helmets. They are actually human, yeah. but but they're e it's easier to watch our heroes shoot them if they're dehumanized. Yes. And right, and then you get you get all, um, also the battle droids. And in the prequels, Lucas had a really interesting challenge. He's going to have Jedi slaughtering an army, right? They just, uh, yeah, that's right. So, what? so he made them droids instead of humans, which actually makes it a lot more palatable. And it, if you notice, like when you kill those droids, it's often comical. So they'll be like, uh oh, and they'll die, and we laugh. Yeah. Even though other things in Star Wars make us think that the droids are very possibly sentient beings that were murdering. But right? these things just fall apart. The limbs come off. There's no blood. There's no nothing. You never get any sense that you're that there's any pain going on here or anything emotional. Not, not with the battle droids. Right. But with C-3PO. That's different. It's an R2-D2. We do care about them, right? So it's interesting, like as a scientist, to look at how uh, franchises like Star Wars manipulate your emotions by uh, and making you care for some droids and not for others. I wonder if part of that for uh, C-3PO, for those who forget, the original Star Wars movie, he's gold, he's an android, mm -hmm. he moves very slowly, but he's got a fantastic, witty British accent. I mean, that just oozes empathy, does it not? We love British accents in these movies. Well, British accents, uh, I, you know, I actually don't know any science on this, but I know that they get used often for villainy, mm -hmm. often for intelligence or stuffiness. And I think that, I think C-3PO is going for the stuffiness. He's a bit stunned. the I mean, stuffy He side. is a kind of an annoying character. He's not like a, he's not beloved like R2-D2 is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so, uh, you know, but, all, but a lot of the villains of the Empire are, have British accents. Absolutely, Count Dooku. Peter Cushing, who's that? Moff Tarkin. Cushing, yeah, Cushing, yeah. and and uh, like everybody in um, Force Awakens, you know. Yeah, mind you, Obi Wan Kenobi. 
Alec Guinness. He yeah, British so he's too. he's going for the sophisticated yeah. British thing. So yeah. Now here's an alien. Did you ever see District Nine? Yes. I really love that movie. I saw that several times. Uh, but I gather you're not a big fan of the prawn. Why is that? Um, so I think the prawn design is an interesting choice because it's a movie that's about it's about racism, right? Um, and in, and it's in, sort of South in Africa movie, in science fiction, yeah. right? This is in the movie it's world. speciesism, but mm -hmm. it's about I mean the pe the allegory is racism, right? And the design, the, you know, the designers made an interesting choice to make the alien look very disgusting and insectoid uh, in a way that's revolting, right? Uh, and I get, and I guess maybe their point was to um, help you understand the racists. Maybe I don't know, but I, I do know that uh, it's very hard for us to feel compassion for uh, insectoid-looking creatures. Isn't so, that so like the the, the uh, Independence Day. Aliens. Mm -hmm. They're typical bug-eyed monsters that you're not supposed to feel empathy for. And when we blast entire ships out of the sky, we're not supposed to shed a tear. And it's because they look, they look like monsters, right? So by making, you know, in District Nine, you know, I, I don't know if the movie would have been better, but I think we definitely would have had more empathy for the prawns if we, if uh, they <clears throat> looked more humanoid, had more humanoid expressions. <clears throat> Let's consider religion here. How about gods? Uh, the creativity sweet spot yeah, that one needs yeah. to apply in order to create a compelling god. How does yeah. that work? So, uh, and I'm sure the audience is wondering why this is being brought up in the middle of a Star Wars discussion, but what's interesting is that if you look across religions, uh, and we're using the anthropological sense of god, which means any supernatural being. It's not like the one god or whatever. It's any, like a ghost is a god, like anything like that. Uh, and there have been some studies, uh, and it's somewhat controversial, but there have been some studies that suggest that um, that gods and religions are members of a particular category, a basic category of things, like physical objects or people or uh, something like that, with one or two characteristics from another one, okay? So it might be a person who can live forever, or uh, a ghost is a, uh, a person without a body, uh, a zombie is a person without life, um, and a, <clears throat> a crying statue is an object that has one biological property. And they find that if you have more than a few of these properties from another category, people start to think it not a plausible god. So even atheists, like you bring people in the lab and you say, okay, here's some, here's some god ideas. There's a, a mirror that talks to you, or there's a, a cat that can uh, walk through walls and it can turn into a, a shelf and it can predict the future, and, and it, you know, you're smiling because it starts to sound ridiculous. It does, yes. But of course, you know, these are gods that you don't, that other people, they're all made up gods nobody believes in anyway. But mm. we find that uh, for uh, religions to take hold, they need to, they need to um, suggest the existence of gods that are kind of in the sweet spot between familiarity and incongruity. And so if you have, a, uh, if you have something from one category with a couple things from another, it's a more plausible idea. And this is separate from what we call merely impossible. So mm -hmm. a baby who can make soup is impossible, mm -hmm. but it's not a very plausible idea for a god, and I'm sure everyone can sort of feel that. It's like a baby that can make soup, who cares? Um, because it's, it's impossible, but it doesn't break category boundaries. It's not like objects can make soup. It's the adults of the baby, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. it's a juvenile, right? So th they've done studies that have shown that. So it relates to the aliens because uh, as I said, we need to have this sweet spot between familiarity and incongruity, right? And so the most successful aliens, and if you look across a lot of the, the major franchises, um, you could, you know, my, I, my first impression was, you know, these really aren't that creative. But then as I started learning about the psychology of religion <clears throat> and started studying like the other aspects of the sweet spot, I realized, you know, there's, it's actually a smart move that they're, that they're, they're making it not too, too creative because then people won't relate to it. Is... Getting back to Star Wars, is the Force God? Uh, the Force is probably not. Con I, I don't think that would classify as a. Uh, mm, that's tough. Yeah, I don't think I have a good answer for that one. Because you don't see the Force, although it is everywhere. Yeah, it's you know it's brought about by subcellular structures that presumably might uh, count as entities mm -hmm. that have something from another uh, category, but. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and it does seem to have a will, so yeah, it might count. Mm -hmm. It might count as a god. Does the sweet spot also apply to music? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and if so, how yeah. so? Well, it applies to art in general, okay. right? So, um, 
if you don't know a particular genre, um, then it often will sound all the same to you. So if you don't know calypso music, or you don't know hip hop, or something like this, or my grandfather, my grandfather would we used to say that uh, it must be the lyrics because all the pop music sounds the same, right? <laughs> Uh, as you start to delve into it, uh, you start to notice the different, you know, the fine differentiations between the different songs and the different subgenres and everything else. Um, and um, and people like stuff that is sort of within a, a genre boundary, and that genre could be in fiction or it could be in uh, a musical style, <clears throat> but it has to have something new too. So the sweet spot's there. And if you and if you listen to like a song, it even manipulates. Uh, your familiarity and incongruity as the song progresses. So a typical Western song structure is you'll have, uh, you'll start with like one or two instruments and you'll add another instrument after a few measures. Like you might start with drums and add the bass and then add the guitar. And, and, and what they're doing is as soon as you get used to one thing and you start to get familiar with it and start to understand it and you're about to lose interest, it adds something new which catches your interest again, hmm. okay? That's triggering the dopamine system, right? So I talked about the opioids, that's pleasure. Dopamine is drive. And so it's making you want to stay. And then the singing starts, right? And you hear a verse, and OK, and then a chorus, and a verse. And then the chorus, you recognize the chorus, and your opioids get excited. And then just as you're getting tired of the verse, chorus, verse, chorus, they make a bridge, which is something totally new, mm -hmm. right? And then they go back to the chorus, which makes you happy again. And it's this like perfectly. Um, it's math. Yeah, it's like, it's like a perfectly uh, engineered mm -hmm. work of art that's manip that manipulates your attention and interest and pleasure and anticipation to uh, keep you interested. This is the science of songwriting. We yeah. may think it's artistic, but actually what you've described there is completely scientific. Well, the, the, one of the things that I'm trying to do um, is communicate to the public that uh, artistic endeavors um, can be informed by scientific findings, right? So, you know, I, I studied you know, stage direction and, and art and all these things, and they have a lot of folk wisdom. But in the last 20 years, there have been a lot of studies that really shed light on some of the things that these uh, artists say and you know how true is it and is it true or not you know and uh, and that's been really exciting hmm. can, can you use these same principles as you have described them creating aliens creating music creating vehicles cars yeah right so, same principles yeah so cars cars are you know cars are an interesting example they, they're they're difficult to make. <laughs> And new new cars that look radically different are hard to make, partially because you have to make whole new factories and they want to reuse chassis and stuff. It's a lot easier to make a new consumer product that's really small, like a fork, than it is mm -hmm. to make a new car. But you know, in, in support of this um, sweet spot idea, they have done studies where, with car experts, and they find that car experts prefer cars that are more uh, innovative, presumably because they know cars so well that their level of um, familiarity is already you know, kind of worn out. They're habituated to so much. Whereas mm -hmm. like somebody who doesn't pay much attention to cars like myself, I can see like a slight difference to a car and be like, oh, that's interesting, where a car designer has seen it a million times, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, this is the same like with genre music, right? So after you, you, know, you first start listening to techno, it might all sound the same, and then you start getting fine gradations, and you need more differences to <clears throat> capture your interest. We have about 10 seconds left, which is enough time for me to <clears throat> ask you to twist your head even more looking in that direction. What is with those glasses exactly, Jim? Oh, these, <clears throat> these glasses are designed to look really good. That's all they're, <laughs> that's all they're for. They don't have a function. Um, other, you know, I will say that they're nice for headphones because it doesn't hurt your uh, ears, but they just hold on very gently. They're very light, and uh, you know, they're, they're there to look good. They so. look very Star Wars, my friend. Yeah, you know, I, I want them to look more Star Wars, but they look kind of Star Trek Yeah. if you look like that. And oh, then yeah, if yeah, you yeah. get really close, it looks like Tron because of the circuitry. But yeah, it's Very definitely good. got a science fiction vibe. <laughs> That's Jim Davies from the Institute of Cognitive Science at Carleton University. Thanks for making the trip in from Ottawa for us, it's Jim. My pleasure. Thanks so much. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.